Well, we thought week eight was going to be a pretty wild weekend in college football, but compared to the last few weeks, it was actually pretty tame. We saw just three top 25 teams go down, and all three of those teams played in ranked versus ranked matchups. That was a guarantee anyways. We did see a handful of other instant classics, a handful of other top teams narrowly survive their games, and of course, we're here to break down all the action from what was a, again, pretty tame, pretty chill week eight. So welcome back to the Gridiron Expert, guys. We're so glad that you could join us today. As always, please continue to like, comment, subscribe, share our videos, and check out everything down in the description below, including these expert picks right here. We want you to go sign up for our expert picks today. We are doing a pretty dang good job. Another winning week here at the Gridiron Expert. Five, four, and one. Did have a push. That's 55%. 55%. Would have wanted to be a little bit better. That backdoor cover in the Clemson-Virginia game really hurt us. Really unfortunate there. But still a winning record here. Winning week here. Still hitting over 55% of our bets on the year. 45, 36, and 1. And we're doing great in our best bet section for college football. 9, 3, and 1 in our best bets over the last handful of games. That is 73.1%. Over the last few weeks in our college football best bet section, we are currently on an 11 to 5 run overall in our NFL bets. So go sign up. Other handicappers are wanting to offer you, you know, a package for a week, for a day, for a month. We're offering you a one time fee for an entire year, and we're doing pretty dang good, beating out over 80% of the handicappers this season. So, a great week here on our expert picks. Great season so far, and our expert picks only going to get better. 27 and 9 on the money line, picking a handful of the upsets that we saw. We went 2 and 1 in those top 25 matchups, 289 and 66 on the year, still hitting over 81% of our bets, solely based, of course, on our picks that we put out each week on the channel, but also our preseason predictions that we're doing in the summer. So let's dive into it. Week 8. The game of the week was, of course, Georgia and Texas, and that is a game where we saw another number one team go down. A few weeks ago, we saw number one Alabama lose to Vanderbilt. Now, just two weeks later, we see another number one team in Texas lose at home to Georgia. Now, that's nowhere near as big of an upset as you know, Bama losing to Vanderbilt, but it was still a surprise to see a Texas team that had looked so dominant all year long look this bad against a Georgia team that did not look great against Alabama, did not look good against Mississippi State, come into Austin and win this game. Now, here's the thing. It was an ugly game, right, for both teams. Neither team eclipsed 300 yards of offense. They combined for seven turnovers in the game. Georgia committed three. Texas committed four. But what it ultimately came down to was the fact that Georgia converted off of the turnovers they forced. Texas did not. Georgia scored 17 points off of Texas turnovers. The Longhorns only scored seven points off of three Georgia turnovers, and they only scored seven because of that very controversial pass interference call. You know, Georgia threw the interception. Texas took it all the way down inside the 10-yard line, but they called it for a pass interference. It wasn't going to count. Then Texas fans we're throwing trash and bottles and everything onto the field. The rest were like, okay, never mind. We're sorry we made you mad. We changed our mind. Uh, it, it's an interception for Texas, and the Longhorns converted to try to get themselves back in the game. So a very wild sequence there. I've truly never seen anything like that, where the refs have overturned a call, a penalty at least, like that. But regardless, Georgia, 17 points off of turnovers. Texas, only seven. The Longhorns tried to make it a game, trailed 23 to nothing at halftime, which was just an abysmal first half showing. Cut it to 23 to 15 in the second half. But they never got closer than that. Georgia was able to put it away. Their defense was phenomenal. And I will say this. Third downs. Third downs was the key in this one. Georgia was 6 for 17 on third downs. Texas just 2 for 14 and just 1 for 5 on fourth downs. The Georgia defense showed us why they are still one of the best in the country. The Georgia defense looked like a Kirby Smart-led defense, and they did it against one of the best offenses in the country in Texas, against one of the best quarterbacks in the country in Quinn Ewers, and even throw Arch Manning in there. He even got some playing time in the first half. So give a lot of credit to Kirby Smart and the Bulldogs for what they did. A hostile environment at night, number one team in the country. Most of uh, the country, including myself, had kind of written Georgia off. I thought Texas was going to win this game. Maybe not in dominating fashion, but I thought they'd win They did not, and now the SEC race has gotten a lot more interesting, and Georgia shows they are not out for the count. They still are a force to be reckoned with and one of the top teams in the entire country. So crazy stuff happening down in Austin for the SEC, 
And we will have a new number one team, not just by the AP poll, but also here at the Gridiron Expert when we release our GE Top 25 on Monday afternoon. So stay tuned for that. Moving on earlier, let's go back. I want to talk about the game of the week first. We'll move back a little bit. Earlier in the day, we saw number six Miami maybe win the game of the day, beating Louisville 40, me, 52 to 45. The Hurricanes are 7 0 for the first time since 2017. And talk about a wild second half. Miami was only leading, what, 24 to 17 at halftime? So mediocre, you know, average score there, no big deal. Then the Hurricanes and the Cardinals decided to combine for 56 points in the second half. That included four touchdowns in a span of five minutes in the third quarter. And this game had it all. We saw passing touchdowns. We saw rushing touchdowns. We saw a kickoff return for a touchdown. We saw a defensive touchdown. We saw everything in this game. But ultimately, Cam Ward was too much for Louisville. 319 yards and four touchdowns, making some amazing play some amazing throws against his Louisville defense. 319 passing yards, as we mentioned. The Canes also had 219 rushing yards. Like Georgia, they were very efficient on third downs, going 9 for 15 on third downs. Louisville just 3 for 12. So a huge, huge win for Miami. Many consider this to be the toughest test, or at least one of the toughest tests they have left, the remaining schedule. Yes, they have to play a good Duke team, but that is in Miami. They do have to go to Georgia Tech, and they do host Syracuse. Those are the three toughest games they have left, and two of those will be played at Miami. So the Canes, once again, proving themselves to be the best team in the ACC in a legitimate college football playoff contender. Talking about the college football playoff, there was an elimination game in Knoxville on Saturday afternoon. At least it felt like that, right? We had number 11, Tennessee. We had number 7, Alabama. Both teams already having a loss on their schedule. One of these teams, on the third Saturday in October, was going to take their second loss of the season, which was very surprising to see one of these teams take their second loss this early in the year. So it was a pretty big must-win game for both these programs. And Tennessee came out on top, winning 24-17. to I will tell you, this is a game... Look, I picked Tennessee. I picked Tennessee to win this game. Go back and watch our video. I lean Tennessee because of the home field advantage. So good for them. Good for good for us here at the Gridiron Expert. But it's not the way I thought it was going to go. Much lower scoring than I expected. Alabama only leading seven to nothing at halftime, and then Tennessee kind of waking up in the second half. You know, having some pretty electric drives there. You know, went 91 yards in seven plays to score in the third quarter. Then went 75 yards in five plays. That Tennessee offense started to look like they had. Uh, you know, or what we expected to see from them, kind of like we saw earlier in the year. But what this really came down to for me was Alabama's mistakes. Tennessee deserved to win this game. I'm not taking anything away from the volunteers here. But Alabama made so many mistakes that when you look back on this, if you're an Alabama fan, you can't help but wonder and look back and go, God, we should have won this game. And look, Listen to these numbers here, right? First off, Alabama held to just 75 rushing yards of day uh, on the day. That's a problem, right? They forced three Tennessee turnovers. The Alabama defense forced three Tennessee turnovers and did not convert on a single one of them. Three Tennessee turnovers, all in the first half, I should add, and yet Alabama only led seven to nothing at halftime. After one of the turnovers, they were set up at the Tennessee 36-yard line, got nothing. Then, earlier in the game, they were held to a field goal after being on the Tennessee 14-yard line. Alabama missed a field goal at the end of the first half. And earlier in the game, also, Jalen Milrow threw a very bad ball in the end zone. They were on the Tennessee 3-yard line, threw a pick in the end zone, allowed for a big return. Interception in the end zone, should have been 7 points. Missed field goal, 10 points. Held to a field goal on the Tennessee 14-yard line. Should have been a touchdown. 17 points. And then, of course, they had the ball on the Tennessee 36 and got nothing out of it. Let's say at least a field goal. 20 points. Alabama probably should have won this game by a large margin. Instead, they continued to shoot themselves in the foot, just like they did against Vanderbilt, just like they did last week against South Carolina, even though they barely won that game, just like they did in the second half against Georgia. Really, Alabama has not looked good at all since the first half of that Georgia game. After halftime, it's like the entire team just fell apart. They narrowly survived the Bulldogs, lost to Vandy, narrowly survived South Carolina, and now the Crimson Tide had their second loss of the year, losing to their bitter rival in Knoxville, and the possibility of Alabama missing out on the 12-team playoff in the first year of the Kalen DeBoer era is very, very possible. It's very much alive if you're a Bama hater. Over in the Big Ten, number 22, Illinois. Talking about teams that are surprisingly bad and struggling, number 2, Illinois 
sends the reigning national champions, number 24 Michigan, to their third loss of the season. Again, we're only in mid-October. Illinois beat them 21-7, and they wore some of the ugliest uniforms I have ever seen. The leather helmet concept was cool, I guess, but the uniforms were disgusting. But their play was not disgusting. Illinois played a Brett Bielema-style game. They were very good in the trenches. They forced a lot of Michigan mistakes. Their defense was phenomenal. And despite Michigan changing to Jack Tuttle uh, at at quarterback, it didn't change anything. Yeah, he had a solid game, 208 passing yards, which is like a record this year for the Wolverines, but he did throw an interception. The Wolverines actually outgained Illinois 322 yards to 267. So by all accounts, this was one of the better offensive performances we've seen from Michigan, but the Wolverines committed three turnovers in this game. That led to 10 Illinois points. They won the game by 14. Obviously plays a very big role, but plays a very big difference there. The Fighting Illini are 6-1. and one. They are 6-1. and one. They have clinched bowl eligibility, and they head to Eugene now for a game against the potential number one team in the country in Oregon in a massive Big Ten showdown. Michigan, again, sent to their third loss and continuing to search for answers on the offensive side of the ball. Now, I want to wrap up today's recap a little bit shorter than usual uh, by giving some credit to two Big 12 teams uh, that had some very big late-game heroics. We go back to Friday night, BYU. BYU, number 13 BYU, scores a touchdown with 10 seconds remaining to stun Oklahoma State, 38-35. to Oklahoma State was leading early in the game, blew the lead, battled back, scored what we thought was the game-winning touchdown with a minute 13 left, but then allowed BYU to go 75 yards in just eight plays in a minute and two seconds to win the game. So BYU, they're 7-0. They are 7-0. and They are atop the Big 12 conference standings. And yes, it is time. If you weren't already, it is time to start talking about the Cougars as legitimate Big 12 title contenders. They're at the top of the standings, but right behind them in a tie, essentially, is number 9 Iowa, or Iowa State, I should say. They're climbing the standings. They are also 7-0. and So who would have thought the two top teams in the Big 12 right now are BYU and Iowa State, They appear to be on a collision course to meet in the Big 12 championship game. And the Cyclones, give them some credit, some late game heroics, overcoming a 28-14 second half deficit to win the game by an identical score, by the way, 38-35. BYU winning their game in the final seconds, 38-35. Iowa State winning their uh, game, 38-35, over UCF, scoring the game-winning touchdown and two-point conversion with 30 seconds left, going 80 yards in 11 plays in just a minute 18 to win the game. Matt Campbell's squad had 530 yards of offense, including 256 rushing yards. UCF had 354 rushing yards on the day. Only 62 passing yards for the Knights. Still nearly pulled off a massive upset on the road against one of the best teams, not just in the Big 12, but in the country. But the Cyclones prevailed. Their defense came through in the clutch. Rocco Beck, despite having an up-and-down game, delivered an amazing drive to win the game and then rushed for that two-point conversion as well. Iowa State will remain in the top 10, not just in the AP poll, but in our GE Top 25 as well. And they've got a relatively favorable schedule the rest of the way. Only a handful of challenges down the stretch. Again, BYU and Iowa State, the top two teams in the Big 12. It appears are on a collision course, which means there's a very good chance that one of those teams, if not both, will be in the college football playoff. And I can guarantee you nobody saw that coming before the season started. So guys, there you go. Week 8. Again, it was a great week. We had some big matchups in Georgia and Texas and Michigan and Illinois and Tennessee and Alabama. Those were the three big games, and all of them were relatively good games. I mean... Illinois game, ugly. Alabama, Tennessee, arguably the best in terms of closeness and competitiveness, but obviously all playing a major role in how these conference races will shape out and obviously how the playoff race will shape out. But by all accounts, it was nothing like week seven or week six or week five, a little bit more tame. We're curious to see what week nine has in store for us. But of course, we'll have those predictions and analysis for the upcoming week coming your way right here on the channel. All the more reason to continue to like, comment, subscribe, share our videos, and check out everything down in the description below. And if you want to win big on the spread picks, for week nine games, go sign up for our expert picks over on the gridironexpert.com. It's one of the lowest prices in the country. It is a full 365 day subscription, full year long, giving you some of the best picks in the country. Picks that are beating out over 80% of the national handicappers, not just this year, but each of the last six years. Picks that are on a 9 3 and 1 run against the spread in our best bets at 73%. Find me someone that's doing better than that. 
We want you to take advantage of it. We want you to join our team. Again, the link down in the description below. And once again, as always, thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you next time right here on the Gridiron Expert. Yeah.